Hello, and welcome to the EU-US Future Forum session. Um, I'm Rachel Rizzo, Director of Programs at the Truman Center for National Policy and an adjunct fellow with the Center for a New American Security. I am so honored to host three incredible panelists with us today for a conversation on rebuilding multilateral cooperation for a global recovery post COVID-19. Today we have with us Dr. Manuel Muniz, Secretary of State for Global Spain, Dr. Chrysula Zakharopoulou, member of the European Parliament and co-chair of the COVAX Shareholders Council, and Dr. Thomas Wright, Director of the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. For all of our audience out there, please follow our conversation on Twitter at EUFF2021, hashtag EUFF2021, um, and please send in questions and we'll get to them towards the end of our conversation. So to get started, today, over a year after COVID-19 changed the world as we know it, many countries are still in the throes of this global pandemic. The United States is on its way to being fully vaccinated and Europe after a rocky few months is now on its way as well. However, nations like India and Brazil have experienced huge COVID surges recently and only 2% of India is vaccinated at the moment, which brings to bear questions about what a truly global recovery actually looks like and vaccine inequities and how we move forward together in an equitable manner. What multilateralism looks like and means as we move beyond COVID-19. So I'd like to jump right into the conversation and go to you, Crisula. You're the new co-chair of the COVAX Council, and the aim of COVAX is to accelerate the development and manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee fair and equitable access for every country in the world. How can initiatives like COVAX assist in global recovery efforts? And is there an opportunity for greater US and European collaboration on these initiatives? Yes. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, yes, sir, since the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this uh, pandemic, uh, the European Union, together with the WHO, uh, has led the global response to the health crisis, creating the ACTA mechanism. One of the pillar, the vaccine pillar of this ACTA mechanism is called COVAX. And it's exactly what you said that can permit to everybody all around uh, the world to have access to the vaccine. And I, so if I can say on the solidarity, on vaccine solidarity and the vaccine openness, yes, Europe is working the work. And it was very important because at that time, European Union was, uh, was alone. The United States didn't participate in, in, in this. Uh, they were f they were out from WHO, so I can say that uh, it was a difficult moment, but we led. So today, uh, we have a new administration with the President Biden, and uh, we were very happy that uh, we can work together. And uh, how we can work together? First of all, uh, uh, the USA has promised and has announced four billion dollars for the COVAX uh, and for the ACTA facility. And I'm very, very happy. Um, uh, European Union um, uh, has uh, given 2.4 billion of, uh, um, of euros. And uh, today, as you, you said something very important, that the USA is almost vaccinated, but USA, until now, didn't export vaccines. Uh, um, European Union is one of the most important producers, exporter, and try to increase the manufacturing capacity. Uh, two days ago, President Borderline announced that European Union export until now 200 million doses. And uh, what means the, this? That we pro produce 200 billion doses for the European citizens and 200 billion of doses for the rest of the world. This is something that, of course, uh, uh, it, it is an example that also United States has to follow because the, the India, who was a, a very important 
producer of vaccine because of the situation, the, the sanitary situation is blocked. So now we need more than ever that uh, uh, USA and Europe take the lead. And uh, uh, President Macron uh, during the G7 proposed to the countries to set up a dose sharing mechanism. And uh, France is the first country who share doses and the other European countries started to share doses. So what we need now uh, to strengthen our multilateralism and what we call, if I can call, as you said, like uh, co-president of uh, the shareholder council of COVAX, please share doses now. Uh, we, we need the United States, we need the 60 million of doses that, pre, uh, uh, that President Biden promised. Please give this 60 million of doses and through the COVAX mechanism. Thank you so much, Crisola. I think you made a, a really excellent point about uh, U.S. exporting vaccines, and I know that there's been some some tension there, and I think that that shows that this recovery is not going to be easy. There are going to be some bumps in the road. So with that, Manuel, I'd like to come to you next. I think I'd like to ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges to successful multilateral cooperation on COVID-19 uh, recovery are we going to see, especially regarding the transatlantic relationship, and what do you think is the best way or some of the best ways to navigate these difficulties. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Rachel, and uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council. I'm very happy to be with you uh, all today. Um, first of all, just a, a quick observation as to how things are seen from this side of the Atlantic when it comes to multilateralism and to the incoming uh, US administration, because the, the signals coming out of Washington, I think are very clear uh, in terms of the support for the multilateral uh, architecture and governance. So, you know, since coming to office, uh, the U.S. administration has uh, rejoined the Paris Accord on the fight against climate change, has rejoined the WHO, has uh, unblocked uh, the nomination of the Director General of the World Trade Organization, has re-engaged uh, the dialogue at the OECD on the global taxation of corporations and digital activities, uh, has expressed an interest in exploring the possibility of rejoining the JCPOA with Iran. Uh, we have agreed bilaterally, the US and the EU, to freeze the tariffs uh, that uh, were product of the Airbus Boeing. I mean, it's, it's 12 billion worth uh, you know, in, in tariffs, and that's very important in particular for Spain, but across uh, the Atlantic. So, I mean, it's a, it's a long list. The messages coming out regarding the EU and NATO are very different. Uh, so that's already very promising because I think it's very difficult to speak of multilateral governance uh, if the U.S. is not very actively engaged in that governance. So it's definitely harder uh, if the U.S. is not at the table. Now, when it, when it comes to COVID and challenges, I'm going to be very schematic and quick because we don't have a lot of time. But I, I would say that on the health uh, dimension, there's an entire area where we need to work together, which is on revamping uh, the global health governance architecture. So we need a stronger uh, WHO. Um, I was speaking to an epidemiologist, a colleague of mine, and uh, uh, he told me the other day something I didn't know, which is epidemiology is not the science of epidemics, it's the science of health data. Uh, so we need to have much smarter uh, health uh, data information systems around the world and early signaling systems, uh, an exchange of information that we didn't have at the beginning of this crisis. Uh, I know there's work on an emerging treaty on the management of pandemics, and I think this will be a part of that. Uh, but there are other considerations about supply chain uh, resilience and others that are linked to the management of the pandemic. I think on the health side, the vaccines is a key topic. There's a summit in Porto in Portugal, as we speak, with uh, European leaders, where this is going to be central. We have the Biden announcement on the on the waiver of IP rights on, on COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, but there are other initiatives on the table that are going to be, if not as important, definitely uh, very important to this that have to do with the exchange of know-how, and with the facilitation of trade uh, of, um, of both inputs to production, but also vaccines that Chris was mentioning uh, before. The second area where I think governance could be improved is on mobility. And I know this might be very specific and narrow, but it's in fact key and central. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ways in which this health crisis has hit our economy, possibly the main way in which it has is through impinging or limiting mobility. So if the 08, 09, 07, 08 crisis 
had its contact point in the financial sector. This crisis has its contact point in the mobility economy and the proximity economy. This is not great news for Spain, as you might, uh, you know, as you might have guessed, because we are a huge uh, uh, beneficiary of international mobility, not just tourism, but uh, many other types. Uh, so unless we deal with this effectively, uh, the crisis will, will be more severe. And since the beginning, there is no single global institution with a mandate to regulate international mobility. You have the WHO somewhere, you have ICAO on civil aviation somewhere else, uh, you have the World Tourism Organization on something else. So uh, it's been very difficult for us to coordinate on this. And we've launched an initiative that we see, by we I mean the Spanish government, uh, to try to get everybody around the table. And in fact, we're very close to uh, arriving at an agreement. It will be announced, uh, it will be presented at the end of May during the ministerial meeting of the OECD to try to come up with a common framework uh, for requirements for mobility, because if not, uh, the whole edifice uh, sort of collapses. And in Europe, we're building a, a green digital certificate for mobility, which will be very important. Final point, the third would be on the economics and the response. I don't think this is a strictly speaking multilateral. I think it's an international space for collaboration and cooperation. But I think it's very significant that we've all come out with very aggressive monetary policies and very aggressive fiscal uh, and economic policies. And what, again, the news, the sounds coming out of Washington, if the Biden administration manages to get through what would then be three economic stimulus packages, the 1.9 trillion one on, on sustaining activity and then the families and infrastructure plans. I mean, that's an injection of, uh, of economic of funding and uh, investment and expenditure uh, with very, very few precedents. And that coordinated with European action, I think, can, can really jolt the global economy back into uh, back into growth uh, in the early fall. So I think in that space, I think we should keep uh, uh, well coordinated and connected. And there are opportunities for our businesses across the Atlantic. So I would I would argue that those three areas, health, uh, mobility, and just a general economic recovery are key areas for collaboration. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, Tom, I'm going to come over to you. Um, you've written a lot about great powers like Russia and, and China and the West's relationship with those states. And so I want to get your thoughts on this. What are the role of states like China and Russia in the global COVID-19 recovery? And how do you think their response to COVID-19 um, will change the West's relationship with these states going forward? And do you think it will? What does that look like? Yeah, thank you, Rachel, and, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for this terrific event and for, for inviting me. Um, so I, I'll get to that in one second because I think it's a really important question, but I just wanted to just add on what my two sort of co-panelists just said. I mean, I think it's important as they um, have observed that, you know, to note, Rachel, as you observed in your intro, we are still very much in the midst of this pandemic. You know, that the last couple of weeks globally have been the worst weeks of the pandemic throughout its entire period in terms of case numbers and fatalities. I think in the last two weeks in April, it's the same number of cases globally as in the first six months of the pandemic through to the summer of 2020. Um, so I think it's easy to sort of forget that in the United States where things are sort of getting better. But as you pointed out, what's happening in South America and India I think is a real reminder that we are not in a post-pandemic world and we were not close, I think, to being in a post-pandemic world. And this virus is endemic now to our societies and we're gonna be dealing with it um, for some time. And I, I think we are behind. You know, I think while I welcome what the Biden administration has done, I think the United States, the EU and other major powers are behind in their multilateral efforts. And I think some people thought, you know, we could wait, do the domestic piece first come to this later and what India shows is that we can't actually wait and I think there's you know the numbers that Chris is talking about are, are you know very welcome in terms of COVAX the four billion allocated by the US last December the money from the EU but this is still very very small sums if you think about two billion four billion the IMF estimates the cost of this pandemic is 26 trillion dollars um, and we're you know sort of not the panelists, but you know, as a world, we're sort of patting ourselves on the back for 2 billion and 4 billion. And then of course, with the funding, it's extremely difficult for COVAX to actually buy anything with the funding. So they have money, but where do you get the vaccines, which is where the donations come in. So I think this is a very important topic. I'm, I'm really glad we have a panel on it, but I think 
you know, there is an urgency here um, that we need to, uh, that, that I think we really need to move forward as a, as a international uh, sort of multilateral coalition. On your question, uh, you know, I think Russia is really sort of a side player in a lot of this, uh, except for the vaccine part where I think they did exceed sort of expectations, but they haven't been sort of a major player in the multilateral effort. I think the real challenge comes with China, you know, and it's, it's this, it's basically, this is the first time in uh, the history of sort of post-Cold War global public health policy where public health is really being uh, conducted through the prism of geopolitical competition, right? And, and the, the US and China and Europe have sort of butted heads at the WHO over this, that will continue. Right, that is going to, this will continue to be a contested zone. The pandemic treaty reforms to the WHO, they are as likely to break down, more likely to break down in acrimony about interpreting what transparency means and rapid response as they are likely to produce anything, uh, you know, really meaningful and long term. So I think that's going to be a very, very difficult needle to thread. We will have to engage in those universal efforts in good faith and try to make it work. But I think we also need to prepare uh, for alternatives to have countries that are willing to work together separately alongside the WHO if some of those efforts maybe don't bear fruit. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, okay, so I'm gonna come to you and sort of build on those comments from Tom. Um, so Russia isn't part of COVAX and China really hasn't contributed much, which I think is notable. We were just discussing that before the panel started. That seems like a pretty significant opportunity for Europe. Um, would you agree? And, and what do you think that those opportunities are? You know, uh, um, thank you, Tom, also, uh, because you have absolutely right we need uh, 26 trillion of dollars. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we are far away from this. China has joined uh, Russia later, but they are not participating and they are not a donor to the COVAX. So uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, it will be nice if uh, they participate because when we speak about the uh, uh, um, a pandemic and a response to this uh, global uh, health crisis. Uh, we need uh, all the countries. It is, is not the case. Uh, your question is how we can... Um, um, yeah. Yes, it seems like there's an opportunity here for, for, for Europe to really be like a major player, if not the major, the major player in the absence of, of big major states like Russia and China. Would you think um, that's... Yeah. I, think, I think that we don't have to see like that when we speak about multilateralism. It's not the egoism. Uh, the panel, uh, we are all in favor of... Uh, or uh, multilateralism and maybe this uh, COVID pandemic uh, remind us that um, all the greatest challenges are global and uh, maybe this uh, crisis can be a shock it is a shock but it has to be also a wake up but we have to join forces and uh, we have to make an inclusive recovery because it's what the citizens ask and if you see today uh, the multilateralism and the, the, the way that we make uh, diplomacy is changing. Uh, uh, I'm very pressed to see the civil society that is very demanded. And uh, I think politicians uh, have to work uh, hand uh, in hand with them and uh, to find solution. It is also uh, another important thing is to give the voice to the youth. And we see what uh, um, uh, Greta uh, tried to do uh, and uh, with her strong commitment uh, on, um, on, uh, uh, on uh, protecting uh, pl the planet. So I think that is not question now of only of European Europe uh, and the USA. But I believe and strongly that uh, this uh, partnership uh, between the two continents uh, has to be successful because we will be stronger and we can lead and uh, share because we share a lot of 
values like uh, democracy, like uh, human rights, uh, and we can achieve goal together. And uh, I'm very happy that United States is back because, um, you know, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, all the relationship and we trust each other. So if we can be the, the two continents that we can uh, achieve uh, no, the leadership, but the leadership because we need all the countries to work together, it will be a success for this new uh, transatlantic agenda that we want. Thank you so much. There was a question from the audience that I think is really interesting. And Manuel, I'd like to come to you with it. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty short question. And, and it's, can cooperation, uh, the likes of which we're seeing on COVID-19, expand to other crises like the global climate crises? And what does, what does that look like? Well, um, it definitely can. I mean, uh, you know, in principle, uh, global governance mechanisms are meant uh, to be far more effective in de dealing with crises that affect uh, all of us. No, and uh, you know, the, the, these mechanisms are there to deal with these issues that are global public goods, and uh, public health is is a global public good. Uh, health is uh, so we have a huge interest. Uh, I mean, it's not just a moral obligation. We have a huge interest in this pandemic being managed and contained around the world, uh, because if not, we're going to be exposed to the risk of import of the disease or to mutations in these places, right? So, I mean, even if you leave the humanitarian and moral considerations aside, uh, I think climate change is a very clear case of this. Um, I mean, these are textbook cases of issues that are uh, that we need to deal uh, with together. Um, now, on the, there are other topics that I think should also be on the international agenda, multilateral agenda, uh, that, that are currently not on it, and, or not significantly. And one of the topics is uh, uh, technology and tech governance, and I know that it was mentioned in some of the sessions uh, before. Uh, it's in fact linked to health governance, but not exclusively. I think this is an emerging field in international affairs. Uh, it's also linked to the debate about uh, democracy and the implications of some of these technologies for uh, fundamental rights and for our political models. Um, and if I had to make a prediction about a field where you're going to see a flurry of initiatives and uh, principally within the European space, transatlantically, but also I think globally, multilaterally, uh, it will be on the governance of emerging technologies. And I think we need to be ready for this, this is a real challenge. Uh, for governments around the world and for um, diplomatic services around the world because it's an interdisciplinary uh, topic and it's tough uh, to handle. Uh, but I think you're going to see a lot of this, uh, you know, really taking center stage. When I look at this final phrase on this, uh, at this field, at the tech governance field, it feels a little bit, in fact, like the climate uh, diplomacy field was 20, 30 years ago. It still seems slightly technical, you know, slightly sort of off the center of the agenda. But I think in some time it will be very central to global governance, just like climate change governance is. Thank you so much. Tom, I'm going to come to you. There's another audience question, which I think builds upon a major item in the news that came out of the Biden administration this week, which is the support for uh, uh, the release of uh, the IP on, on vaccines, waivers for, for patents. So given this new administration support for this, um, what else do you think the Biden administration should be doing a, a, as a priority to to uh, fight against COVID-19? And do you think that this could potentially, I mean, it's already kind of caused some friction in the transatlantic relationship over the last few days, but do you think that's going to be uh, long lasting? Um, yeah, I don't think it will be long lasting. I mean, I broadly, I broadly sort of support the decision. I think, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, vaccinating the world and scaling up production as quickly as possible um, to get ahead of the variants and to make that sort of priority and to really put the resources behind it, I think is vital. Otherwise, you know, we're used to multi speeds and unfairness and inequalities, but we don't want a fixed sort of multi tier world, you know, where you have a largely unvaccinated part and a vaccinated part and, and the connections between them are diminished. You can't really travel from one part to the other without great difficulties. And we need to do everything possible to avoid that. So I think the, 
the TRIPS waiver, I think, is a very positive sign. I would say I think it is, it's a complicated, you know, topic, I think, and, 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 and I think it'll be interesting to see how the negotiations go, and I don't think it's a silver bullet, and I think the export side, uh, you know, there's going to be billions of vaccines produced this year, so the export side, I think, is, is key, but I think what bothered me a little bit about the announcement yesterday was just, you know, I think the U.S. and Europe should have done this together, and the fact that Europe didn't seem to know, and the Secretary of State had been in Europe the day before meeting the G7 ministers. It just seemed a little bit, you know, all over the place. And so I, I was, I, th that was a little surprising to me. I think it's very important that on a transatlantic basis, we see that EU US peace sort of functioning as much as possible, you know. Um, in, a, in a unified way, in a bold way, and making, you know, addressing these crises in India or South America really a key, a key priority. Thank you so much, Tom. Crystal, I see you nodding, and, and I wanted to come to you and see if you had anything to add to that as well. I totally agree with Tom. When we want to restart our transatlantic trans relation, to things like that, uh, we have to collaborate and we have to speak uh, before to make the announcement. I think it's very important because um, yesterday with uh, the decision and the, of uh, President Biden, I was a little bit surprised also, uh, me too, because I know that the question of the intellectual property uh, uh, waiver it is important, but at this moment, uh, we have a problem how we can increase the manufacturing capacity. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, and the problem we're not going to uh, resolve with the intellectual property waiver now. And as I said at the beginning, um, the next two months will be a stress test for many, many um, uh, countries. We ha the WHO asked 20 million of doses for people who had received the first dose and they don't have the second one. So that's why uh, uh, I totally agree with Tom and Russell. I think that we have to make the things step by step and uh, we have to, to speak together because uh, it's not a question uh, now who will have the leadership because the issue is global. And uh, this is my comment. So that's why you saw me to be totally, to agree totally with Tom. Thank you so much. Manuel, we have a couple, we have about two minutes left. So I wanted to see if you had any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with. And if you if you wanted to um, tack on to the, this conversation uh, on the uh, patent waivers and uh, transatlantic cooperation that uh, Tom and Crisula just uh, ki kindly got us started on. Sure, sure. Just a very quick comment that I agree with uh, what Tom and Chris have uh, said. It's a very complicated topic. Uh, we have a large number of voluntary licenses have already been given. So the licensing issue uh, is a bottleneck, but it's not the only bottleneck. Uh, there are others that have to do with supply chains and they have to do with the transfer of know-how and support of producers in other places. Uh, so it's not exclusively uh, a, a licensing uh, problem. So probably the initiative that has been launched by the US president will have to be uh, accompanied by other measures uh, that allow for this uh, system to in fact function and lead to real production. Um, and just as a final thought, uh, I'll end I think with a, a comment that is close uh, linked to my opening one, no? which is I think it's a, it's a very interesting time to be talking about multilateral cooperation and transatlantic relations because we have a US administration that believes in multilateralism. I think this is, has now been made clear and it will be made even clearer I think in the coming months. Uh, that is much more closely aligned with Europe on a whole range of issues, particularly those linked to the transatlantic agenda. And I think that that will enable us also to close all of these smaller irritants in the relationship, all of those smaller issues that were in, present in the relationship, and focus on the broader questions that I think have to do with the health of our democracies and with the health of um, the international liberal 
governance architecture and of international liberalism and democracy more broadly. So I think that uh, we have a strong, a wide agenda uh, to to um, to work together uh, in the coming weeks and months. So I think it's a positive time to be discussing these things. So wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. And that's a very hopeful note on which to end. So thank you again to our panelists. And with that, I would now like to turn it over to a spotlight on transatlantic cooperation in vaccine development with the director of the CDC, Dr. Rachel Walensky.